Okay, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to today's Global Leader. It's great that you're joining us again at this uh, ESMT talk series where you can meet outstanding uh, leaders from the industry and get to know their leadership philosophy. So it's great to have you here. I'm also, also greeting the online audience, uh, all those uh, people watching us online. And I was hesitating in the beginning because I got the sign that we have to wait until the online audience is joining us as well. So welcome to you as well. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Astrid Frohloff. I'm a TV journalist and a politics uh, moderator, and I have the pleasure to lead you through the evening tonight. Um, in this format, uh, prominent business leaders uh, are sharing rare insights into their profession and um, into their leadership task. And um, I think some of you might remember that we have had Carsten Spohr, Deutsche Lufthansa, with us, that we have Ola Kilenius, uh, Mercedes-Benz with us. And it's a great pleasure and, uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, that our guest today is a female leader. She has extensive experience in top positions in which she was responsible for IT and transformation in companies such as Deutsche Bank, uh, Deutsche Postbank, DHL, Deutsche Telekom and others. Today she bears responsibility in an industry that deals with a, with a central uh, topic uh, for the future and this is energy. Since uh, 2020, she is member of the executive board, CHO and labor director at RWE, RWE, one of the biggest uh, um, energy companies in Europe. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have as our guest today, Zvezdana Zega. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> So I'm excited uh, to our conversation, but first of all, uh, of course, I would like to ask our host uh, to come on stage for his opening remarks. You know him all. It's, it's uh, great that you have time to join us tonight. Please give a warm welcome to the president ESMT, Jörg Rochal. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Astrid. Thank you very much for the kind welcome for the warm um, applause. It's really um, a great pleasure, as Astrid mentioned, to welcome you to the third event uh, in our series, Today's Global Leader. This is uh, a vital part of what we do, what we stand for. Um, strong leaders have to play a vital part uh, in public debate in Germany, including business expertise. Because it's uh, very clear uh, to us, I think to everybody, that positive leadership Business competencies are more important than ever before. And this not only holds for business, but uh, it transcends into many other parts of society. And this holds in particular at a point of time where transformation is uh, very strong. Everybody talks about transformation. Uh, you probably hear about transformation in every type of societal dimension, not only in business, uh, but far beyond. And uh, it's also important to have great leaders who actually, um, by their example of leading, provide great role models for those who really look for orientation, who look for um, answers to the questions they have when it comes to the transformation, but also the uncertainty that comes uh, with this transformation. We at ESMT, um, as you may know, have leadership as one of the three topical pillars on which we rest, on which we build our business school. And uh, in particular, we would also like to use this as a platform, as a discourse um, across generations, so um, that uh, we also have knowledge transfer, that we can understand how proven, distinguished leaders um, do this and how they actually uh, take their decisions. As you may also know, um, ESMT is still a pretty young school. Um, we were just uh, found, I mean, we were founded 20 years ago. We just celebrated our 20th birthday at the end of last year. And uh, one of the leading companies that actually founded ESMT was RWRVE. And thus, as Astrid said, we are extremely pleased, honored, and privileged to have uh, Nana Sega with us here today, member of the executive board uh, of RWE. Um, and I should add, uh, Nana Sega is not only a member of the executive board of RWE, but also a member of the supervisory board of ESMT. And um, 
I could say, a really a staunch, sta staunch uh, champion for ESMT. So in that sense, um, Nana, um, you're, the, you're a very great example of what today's global leaders really uh, is all about and what the series is all about. Uh, let me also thank the Initiative Zukunftsfähige Forschung, uh, because we really highly appreciate the great cooperation we have. Uh, we really uh, highly appreciate the generous su support uh, that you provide in order uh, to make this um, happen and in order to actually enable uh, this uh, fantastic format for which we have received uh, such outstanding feedback so far. And uh, we will hear more from you. So this means from the uh, IZF board member Uta Menges and the IZF Berlin chapter lead Claudia Honner later in the evening about uh, wh why you do this and uh, what this is all about. So with this, without any further ado, honored guests, it's my great pleasure um, to uh, announce or hope and hope to announce and to share uh, an enlightening dis discussion that will follow now, not only here at ESMT, but also um, online. Uh, with this, um, I will hand over to our, our moderator, our distinguished uh, guest tonight, and like to thank you for your interest and uh, being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jörg Rochel. But uh, before we go into our conversation, uh, we do something else. Those of you who uh, have joined the today's Global Leader before might know that uh, before we are uh, setting this, that for setting the stage, uh, we put a brief glance uh, on the subject uh, from the scientific side. And this is what we want to do today. We are very glad that uh, Tatjana Ewent, uh, Assistant Professor of Strategy at ESMT Berlin, uh, will set the stage. Uh, she also is Volkswagen Group Junior Chair for Diversity Organizations, so the right person at the right place, and we're looking forward to your speech. Tatjana. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Astrid for the introduction, thank you for Molly for inviting me to, to speak tonight and to introduce tonight's conversation with uh, Nana Zeger. Um, my research, um, as the name of my chair might have indicated over the past years, is focused on the topic of inequality in organizations. Uh, and in particular gender inequality. As such, uh, my introductory speech will focus on potential directions that the conversation on diversity within organization might take in the future. All right, so let's get started. Most diverse comp companies now more likely than ever to outperform financially, delivering growth through diversity in the workplace. Racially diverse companies are 25% more likely to financially outperform their competition. These headlines and similar ones have received significant attention in the media and within companies in recent years, suggesting a direct causal link between a more diverse workforce and leadership and financial performance. However, reality is far from being so straightforward. The majority of academic evidence to date indicates little or no causal effect between diversity and financial performance. These headlines primarily highlight a correlation that is a positive relationship between these two variables. Yet correlation, as we know, does not imply causation. Um, the correlation that the reports find may be explained by another variable that moves with these two and even potentially a reverse relationship where you could see more financially stable companies being in a better position to invest in initiatives to increase diversity and to reach that kind of position. What's actually become apparent in the past year through rigorous academic work is that in practice, it's certainly not as easy as more diversity equals more money. Sure, in theory, the idea that introducing people with previously underrepresented views, ideas, experience, and points of view into decision-making areas should bring benefit to organization makes a lot of sense. But in practice, recruiting um, diversity people from underrepresented group is not the same thing as retaining them and giving them a voice long enough so that they may express those ideas. And it's certainly not the same as listening and learning from them. There's simply no guarantee, no magic, magic mechanism that will make swapping out a couple of white men from members of previously underrepresented groups result in increased performance. This emphasis on learning, what we now call inclusion, is crucial 
but as more and more academic research shows, it demands radical changes in how companies operate that go beyond adjustments to recruitment processes, unconscious bias training, or funding affinity groups in the workplace. Unfortunately, existing barriers in our current approaches prevent these radical changes from occurring. Allow me to outline some of these barriers. Professor Robinelli at HBS refers to these barriers as sacred cows. These are practices or closely held beliefs that in organizations that cannot be questioned or criticized. Challenging these sacred cows threatens the identities and established ways of those who currently hold power in organizations. These sacred cows were instrumental in the success and questioning them can, can be perceived to be akin to challenging these individuals, which understandably makes it a sensitive matter. These sacred cows are deeply ingrained in organizational cultures and represent untested assumptions about how work should be done and what defines talent. One potent assumption or sacred cow is what academics refer to the, as the ideal worker norm. According to this norm, an ideal worker is a worker who demonstrates an unwavering commitment to paid work, working long hours and prioritizing the job over family and personal aspects of life. Many organizations and most of the leadership positions throughout society have been designed around and for workers who adhere to this norm. Companies tend to aspire to have ideal workers and incentivize employees to meet this criteria. And thus sometimes this commitment and the appearance of being always available, physically present in the office, tends to overshadow skills, efficiency, and results when it comes to making important decisions such as raises or promotions. Let's consider an example. On the one hand, you have employee A, a spending long hours at the office, answering emails within 10 minutes of receipt, including on Saturdays and Sundays, attending every happy hour event and company dinners, etc., etc. On the other hand, you have employee B, delivers the same, if not better, quality of work. However, they leave the office earlier. Occasionally, they work from home. Um, they schedule team meetings only between 9 and 4 p.m. They answer emails diligently, but just not on the weekends. What tends to be true is that in most organizations today, employee A will get the promotion of our employee B. They do their job just as well, and we can even venture to say that employee B's team member are more happy at work, less likely to burn out. But employee A's behavior sends the type of signal that we've learned to interpret as commitment, dedication, potential for success. Um, and so even though, and that's the case, even though employee B may be just as committed to the company's success as employee A. But we don't see it because in our eyes, that's not what commitment and potential look like. This way of doing is problematic. And I'm not saying don't promote employee A, I'm saying don't discard employee B, simply because their way of doing the work is different from what has always been done. This ideal work, worker norm I was telling you about is powerful, right? Because it's reinforced by deeply subjective statements I feel like we've all heard, such as, I know talent when I see it. I can sense this person as potential. Underlying these statements is often a recognition of the qualities that align with personal preferences rather than objective criteria, qualities that one possesses oneself. This norm does prevent existing leadership from fully supporting potential leaders um, who have backgrounds, work styles that are different than their own. Um, leaders ingrained, ingrained in this mindset does struggle to recognize potential, to develop, uh, promote, and support people um, who have different qualities and demonstrate quality in, different, in a distinct way. Why does that happen, even when there might be a genuine commitment from companies and leaders to diversity? For a leader that has sacrificed their personal life, working extremely long hours, attending those business dinners I was telling you about, going on extended business trips, maybe adopting some cutthroat tactics to reach your current position, recognizing and acknowledging that alternative ways of achieving success can be challenging, exist can be challenging. Um, it requires confronting a certain mental model of success um, and personal identity intertwined with that model. Challenging the ideal worker norm may imply questioning one's identity, one's choice, the belief that one must be extraordinary to reach a certain position, the notion that the known path is the only way. 
But if we want to create inclusive workplaces, leaders need to recognize that there are various paths to being successful and useful to the running of an organization. This change in mindset becomes even more cr crucial in a context where talent is scarce, where companies struggle to recruit and fill positions to, that are necessary for their growth. Such circumstances demand a deep reflection on the systems in place to identify, develop, accommodate, and promote talented people. Mothers, in particular, when returning to the workforce after having children, face numerous challenges in obtaining positions that align with their education, skills, and ambitions. If companies don't want to waste their people's talent, they must reconsider and redesign work better to utilize the potential of their employees, offering, for example, carefully crafted on-ramps back into career paths for individuals who have taken extended breaks from work. And actually, that applies regardless of gender. Mental models need to change so that people who've taken such extended breaks in their career can still be considered as having potential, such that a fulfilling career path that potentially leads to leadership position can exist for them. Um, rethinking the system and rethinking work is key in harnessing the benefits of diversity. Diversifying the workforce will have no impact if the intent is to have members of underrepresented groups fit the mold of the way things have always been done. There's nothing to learn from in that scenario. You'll end up with people who may look different but have been shaped to think and do the same. What is key here is that when you're limited by this sacred cause, you kind of steal yourself of a learning opportunity. And that's not good for business. There's often more than one way of doing things successfully and being willing to hear about other people that are different from you and how they do it can bring learning and encourage you to develop new skills. I like this example from Professor Amandine Odi um, at McGill. She conducted ethnographic research in the re region of Champagne uh, among grape growers. And what she found was that female grape growers were quite isolated uh, from the social context, um, social support systems in the Champagne region. Um, mainly because male grape growers didn't want to work with them. So they faced that isolation, but they decided to fight against it. And to fight against it, they met between each other. And they did something as they were meeting that really broke norms of what was current in the Champagne region. They discussed prices, the prices that they were charging the, cham the Champagne houses for their, for their grapes. And because they did that, they were able to charge systematically higher prices than the male grape growers. But the male grape growers, I mean, they wouldn't do that, right? Like price secrecy was the norm. That was not the way that business was historically been done. But by having to kind of navigate a form of isolation, women were able to derive better um, financial success for their enterprises. So a new understanding of how to do a job that came from being deliberately isolated and barred from traditional ways of doing because of bias and discrimination, led to higher performance. This is one example of other ways of working that deviate from the accepted norm but lead to positive outcomes. There are others. Coming from the margin means you see a path where no one had to look for one before. And more often than not, you find it. In an organizational context, after a manager finds out about this new way of doing, there's usually two ways things can go. Either one can learn from it, teach the new way, the new skills to everyone, extend that knowledge to the majority group so that the organization as a whole benefits, or one can punish the norm violation and force these innovators to strictly follow the traditional way of doing, thus impeding both these people's success and the firm's success at the same time. This is where I think leaders play a crucial role. They are the one that must create spaces for new ideas, for challenges to the status quo. They must recognize and celebrate them and give credit where it's due. These spaces from learning from difference obviously can exist at different levels of the organization, but the change must start at the top. Leaders are the custodians of their organization's culture. They set the tone and the vision. It's essential that this vision is aspirational, going beyond the mere desire to eliminate biases. Leaders need to reflect on why fostering an inclusive environment matters, what is at stake, and why they truly care about it. They must lay out a clear vision and communicate it frequently. Finally, this vision should permeate all aspects of the business. The actions of leaders must align with their organization's diversity and inclusion commitments. Employees are always watching. 
And while research shows that social responsibility practice such as DNI can increase employee motivation, this motivational effect will dissipate if leaders contradict themselves in other spheres of the business, thus engaging in green or pink washing. In conclusion, the business case for diversity may not be as straightforward as we might have liked it to think, but that's okay. The moral duty to end discrimination should be enough to convince us to keep making progress, progress towards more equality within organizations. And if organizations truly want to harness some benefits out of diversity, they must be ready to challenge core tenets of how they conceive of work and how they define talent. Thank you for your time and looking forward to the upcoming conversation. Thank you very much, Tatiana Ewand, for sharing your findings with us, and uh, I'm sure we can take this uh, nicely into our discussion. So now is the moment that I would like to ask my guests to come on stage. So again, a warm welcome to Nana Zega. <laughs> Please join me here at sure. our desk. So first of all, we have to clarify something about your first name. <laughs> You told me that nobody actually uh, is using your official first name, Zvezdana. Is exactly. This pronounced You're right. correctly, more or less? More or less, yeah. More or le less, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> no, 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 it was, it was quite good. Yeah. So people call you Nana Zega. That's exactly. The, that's the way. So, so stay with Nana. Okay, great. So uh, what I suggest is that we will have a conversation, first of all, here uh, on stage, and then you are invited, of course, to put questions as well. And we would like to invite the audience uh, online uh, as well to use the chat and send us some questions already now, if you would like to. I'm happy to pass them to you. So, um, Nana Zega, before we dive deeper into the diversity uh, topic, let's, uh, let's get a broader perspective. Uh, as a highly accomplished executive, you have held diverse uh, uh, leadership uh, roles throughout your career. I mentioned some of the companies you have been with, Deutsche Bank, uh, Deutsche Postbank, DHL, but also Tall Collect, Arcandor. Uh, quite often you acted as a, you can say, troubleshooter. You helped uh, to reorganize companies, restructure companies. So, um, to put it in one nutshell, uh, what leadership qualities do you think are essential for success in the business world, particularly from the female perspective? Well, I'm not sure there are different perspectives when you talk about leadership. You just act differently, but you're looking towards the same topics. You have to listen to people, you have to understand what they are saying, you have to promote them, you have to support them, you have to be reliable manager and help them create future. You have to understand that you are there for them and not they are there for you. And that's what makes a difference from my perspective between good managers being available for their teams and managers who believe that team is there only for them and are personally not available. So how would you define your role as a leader? Do you see yourself more as a coach or a boss or a promoter, something else? Rather coach and a boss, uh, coach, oh, excuse me, coach and a, and a manager, but not as a boss. Mm -hmm. I believe in a collective intelligence. I believe more of us, if we talk about topics, can find better solutions uh, than acting like in a last century where there is one person deciding. I believe we have evaluated along these last years and that's very important. Mm -hmm. So I understood you don't see big differences between men and women when it comes to leadership. Uh, but do you think, or from your own experience, um, did you face specific challenges being a female leader compared to your male uh, colleagues? Uh, probably just to phrase it out, there are not differences in the topics, mm -hmm. but there are different ways to approach it. Okay, what's the difference then? Well, we, we, we are simply different. Uh, I mean, we do have the same knowledge, but I never wanted to be a better man. And 
uh, that's something that's important from my perspective if you, if you act as a female. If you act in a managing environment trying to show every man that you are a better man as a female, you might rather fail. Mm -hmm. um, probably just to pick one point which most of you would have in mind when I say it, did you realize that the majority of a bodyguards taking care of the most important people of the world are women? Are they? Yes, mm -hmm. because they are de-escalating. Uh -huh. that's, that's one of the main reasons. Uh, the way when woman enters the meeting room, it is never as loud as if it, they're only men. And it's not because men are not nice to it, that it's just differ, different way acting with each other. Um, and I, I just learned to stay a female and to, to do my, my own way while heading for the same goal. And my male colleagues seem to appreciate it because I didn't ever believe that I have to show them, as I said, that I'm a better man, I'm not. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, de-escalation, so how do you um, address, how do you recognize problems in your surrounding, in your teams? Is this, uh, I mean, is this really something women can do better, maybe even, or do they just do it in a different way? Are they, you know, have they really better skills to de-escalate uh, personal problems? They probably do it teams? a bit different way, mm -hmm. but I would not say that they, they do it better. It's, it's just different. And when we talk about diversity, uh, I just have to come to that point. It's not one is better than the other. It's just uh, different ways, different cultures, different types of approach certain things make all the topic better. So I, I probably better, as a female, better get around the feelings within a topic and approach it probably a softer way, but with the same clear words, um, while the men would use a different words and a different way, still heading for the same beliefs mm. and the same outcome. Mm -hmm. Um, before we go into the diversity topic, um, let's uh, talk a little bit about your your career. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming uh, a top-level executive in different fields and how you navigated and maybe overcome gender stereotypes or other stereotypes? You Let me mention that you were born in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I mean, you can hear from your name. Uh, probably um, you studied economics in Freiburg in Germany. So uh, can you briefly give us, uh, you know, a glimpse into into your career and how you made it? Look, I'm 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 close to a round number called six zero, so it's a long journey. I'll try <laughs> to make it very short. Uh, yes, I'm born in Sarajevo. I finished my um, college there, no high school, and then I went to study in Germany. Um, well, actually, as I stayed in Germany, and that's an honest answer, I had to work because I had limited stay and work allowance. So if I had lost any job, I would have to go back to Yugoslavia, and that's what I didn't want. So if I had to work, I said to myself, I want to know how far it goes. Uh, I never ask my question, which is probably normal in the Western world, should I work, what does it mean? Because in a society I came from, it was completely normal that both work. So I didn't know any other model. Uh, in, in, in my home country, it was a completely normal model that mother and father have to work and that kids are being taken care of by grandparents or whomever, or they had a key. Mm -hmm. I had a key. I mean, <laughs> um, so given this situation, I at one moment of, of time gave myself a target where I want to be in this industry, but not with a goal to come there, but with a goal to kind of follow my way. And that's something what I see with many young people when you ask them, what is your plan towards end of your career? They mostly think just two or three years adv in advance. And if you think only two or three years in advance, the question could appear 
appear that you're again and again learning the same, but not broadening your view. So whenever I mentor someone, I give them a advice to think about the way forward, even if they never reach it. It is not important to reach your final goal, but it is important to broaden your knowledge and to broaden your view. And that's how I went through it. I mean, there is, you said, Chief Human Resources Officer. I told you I'm also responsible for an IT. Normally, when my people ask me, I say I'm an intern in HR, but with very good knowledge in IT. I'm uh, <laughs> doing IT since 30 years plus, so that's my past, that's yeah. my... That's my path throughout my career. I started very early with that. And we will talk about and this follow later that on. I have a lot of <laughs> questions about this as well, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, but, but I, I'm, I really would like to understand, and I think uh, many of, you, of the, the young professionals as well, how did you really manage to get where you are now? Last time we have had uh, Ola Kelenius with us from Mercedes-Benz. Uh, and What did he tell he you? Was, well, he was, uh, he was telling us about his uh, career which he started very early as, at Mercedes-Benz, and then he like climbed all the, the steps up until the position where he reached now. So, And you had so many different top-level positions, so how did you get so quick so far? Well, you call it quick, I would not call it like that. No? Well, probably the waterfall moment of my career was toll collect. Toll collect? Yeah, because after three crashes, no one want, wanted to go there from Deutsche Telekom, and my, my dearest boss, uh, sorry, he died at 48, about a year thereafter, after we started, called me and said, Would you, I, I need to talk to you, and I was like, I just started my N-1, minus you call it today, right below the board position, and said, so, well, you know, I want you to go to Toll Collect, we have got one more chance, and someone has to take care of the client. And they had yeah. a lot of problems at that time. They, the they crashed uh, already LKV three mouth. times. They yeah. crashed already mm -hmm. three times. So they got given one last chance by the government. And, well, I asked him, how long can I think it over? And he said, until I get a cup of coffee. So I was, I was clear there is mm. no, no time to think about it. So, I mean, you could say yes or yes, say no. I will, I guess I didn't have any chance to say no. I said, well, okay, fine. Take care of the customer. And then they had a... It, it, it's real insight, only people who were there know it. There was a supervisory board meeting, they had to decide to change the management board, and he came out and said, well, Nana, I'm really sorry, but you have to take over the technical part as well. You must know 90% of Toll Collect was technics. I mean, I, I was like, so, well, I thought about a client, well, I'm so sorry, but it's now done, we decided. So, um, that was... The fact that we made it work after nine months um, was probably the one chance you need along your career. You have mm -hmm. actually more than one. But that was the point probably where I had a chance to show that I'm able to manage complex environment and people who were not really happy at that point of time. They were highly frustrated coming home, hearing from their families that they are not really good. They were every day on the first page, page of the newspaper, which was not really promising when you work under these circumstances. So that's the point from which on I went into the board of these systems. And you call it quick. I mean, it was kind of the same level for a mm -hmm. certain amount of time. So. Mm -hmm was just cross other industries because my personal view was if that's the end of the career, let's learn and see something different mm -hmm. with your IT background. And I have to say it was, it was really interesting. You have to understand for yourself even that the sidestep can bring you a step further, mm -hmm. that it does not necessarily need to be step up. Mm -hmm. I quickly have to ask, can you understand everything? I hear this little click here, maybe it's just the speaker. Is everything fine with the microphone? Okay. Good. Okay, I'm relaxed. Does it uh, give you an answer? Yes, absolutely. Yes, um, and I also um, understood that uh, it probably needs um, a certain flexibility and the ability to, to open up for new topics. As you said, they suddenly ask you about technical 
uh, things you had to understand. So you had to learn and learn and learn. And um, uh, Sure. I mean, I, I was a lucky one being yeah. asked to do techniques because, I mean, as I started studying, I wanted to study electrotechnics. And mm -hmm. I do have, meanwhile, only South European mother, but I had two Southern European parents who said, what, electrotechnics? That's nothing for girls, forget it. <laughs> um, so my only way was to study economics as kind of compromise between medicine and electrotechnics <laughs> and to run right into the technical part of the job as mm. soon as I had a chance really? for that. Yeah, yeah that's why I <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we talk about the technical part as well, but um, I, I would like to understand a little bit more about your leadership philosophy or whatever you call it. Um, if you look back at, at your first steps, um, we have this uh, audience here with a lot of young people. Um, how did you learn to lead? I mean, how was it actually to get responsibility, leading your own team, making mistakes maybe in the beginning? Let me start with one thing. The first and foremost thing, I had, I was lucky to have really good managers. They teached me a lot, they mentored me a lot, and they allowed me to make mistakes and to retry it again. And I believe that this failure, allow failure, don't allow failure three times, but allow failure and help to overcome it, because that's the way you learn, is something which is very important. I had a great manager who gave me a chance to get, have responsibility for teams very early. So that is my second learning. Don't wait until someone is 40-something. Give them the responsibility in their 20s. They are able to handle it. Don't stand there and believe with your 50-something or 60, you are able to understand it all and they're simply too young. No, if they are not too young to get married, if they are not too young to get kids, they are not too young to lead. So start early, support, be there, be available. And be trustful as well. And be trustful as well. Mm -hmm. Give them a hand to stand up when they fall, but allow them to also learn by doing. What we have in many areas is that this discussion, oh, they're too young. They probably should wait a few years longer. Why? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I always got a chance. If someone doesn't want to take a chance, that's different. But open up a chances to people. That's, from my perspective, the most important thing managers have to do every day. I mean, we both spoke about this generation of today where I said I don't believe in it. This, this life, work-life balance generation, I simply do not see them as a work-life balance generation. Probably I have 29-year-old, not at home, in Munich. But, but yeah, but this you, have to, no, this you have to explain because it's an interesting point. We have talked earlier and you, uh, you said that um, you have really, you know, a strong opinion about the young generation who, do, who, do, who wants uh, a work-life balance. You have an understanding. So why is this something good? Because a lot of, um, um, well, it's, uh, it's not easy <laughs> for a lot of companies to deal with this desire of having a lot of free time. We're discussing now the four days uh, work week, yeah, working only four days a week. So why do you think it's, it's really good and necessary to have a good work-life balance? Let me pick up something from, from Tatiana. Work employee A and employee B is the classical way in many areas how you look at people. As my 29-year-old son started his first job, he was talking to me about FaceTime, and I didn't get it. I asked, what is FaceTime? And he said, well, you have to be present to be seen. And I just didn't get it. What is it? It means as long as you are there, as better your manager sees you, so you, you, you're better promoted. I tried not to do so. Because I strongly believe the outcome is important. I also believe that us who are 
different generation have to understand, because we live with it, what has really changed. As I started working with my 21, post came, arrived at 11 o'clock. You worked through it, probably someone worked on your phone, which was on the desk. Uh, but that was it. When you left office, no one was able to reach you anymore. And when you were on holidays, you were on holidays. We learned all that the world is turning by far quicker. But what we have forgotten are basic behaviors, especially as a managers. Means it is normal to send an email 11 o'clock in the morning and to 11, expect an answer back in, at 11.05. It is completely normal because mobile phone exists, email exists, to just call someone when he or her is on holidays. In our 20s, that was not possible. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this young generation, which we, we call today work-life balance generation, is trying to find a small piece of privacy within a world of today where we, as a grown-up managers, simply forgot that we grew up differently and they also need a small part of privacy. Does it mean f only four days of work a week? That's not what I mean. But I mean it must be a of, part of privacy for every one of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I treat my guys. I would never, ever accept it's a really burning platform. But it must be a burning platform and it must be talking about the one specialist in this topic pick up my mobile phone and call someone who is on holidays. Because I believe it is simply not fair due to the fact that it works with technology today, that we just believe they're all available for us anytime in this life. And instead of accepting that, we started calling the work-life balance generation. Mm -hmm. What I see with our young people is they're really giving a tremendous impact. They're just seeking for this little piece of their own privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting, talking about uh, impact. Um, I would like to uh, grab up what uh, Tatiana said about uh, diversity um, and would like to get an understanding of what impact you feel with diverse teams. I know that uh, RWE, RWE is strongly committed to diversity. You're doing a lot of things there. How do you foster a culture of diversity and inclusion within your organization? And, and what's, what impact can you really see on having diverse teams? Okay. I believe we still all force it. We have to force it until it is grown to the certain level. Because that's where I'm economist. Statistically, I'm looking at Jörg. Everything what's below 30% can go back to zero. In order to develop itself, that's what I learned in statistics in my mm -hmm. university times, mm -hmm. you have to get to this 30% to have it regenerate itself. Mm -hmm. um, I personally believe that diverse environment is inspiring environment. And I'm not calculating like they have pluses on a balance sheet, but different cultures, different views give you a chance to look at a certain topic from a different perspectives. That's why we force our internationality, we force our gender diversity, we try, for example, what Tatiana said before, uh, we have a special program for uh, mothers returning back after four or five years to get involved in back into the job. Because you have a situation, they were five or six years out of the job, they apply for something, like, oh, where have you been last six years? Mm -hmm. So we have a special program doing it. We have different communities, we have uh, women f uh, network, we have LGBTIQ plus community, uh, we have international communities. We start try not to send Germans around the world, but we try to get people from every country in all 39 countries where we are and then to get back. But you have to stay on it. 
You have to stay on it. You have to la ask for experiences. You have to listen and to implement it in everything that you do new. If you don't stay on it, it is still endangered, I believe not only in my company, but in many, to be forgotten. So you have to do formalities like what is with your short list, what is with your long list. Uh, if you don't have enough females from inside, I want you to post the job also outside. Did you look in this area? Let them f nominate themselves in the, in, instead of us picking the people. And that's what your daily job. Mm. It's not an easy one, but it's worth it. Mm. Um, you are overseeing not only HR services, employee relations, uh, also information technology, internal audit and security, and talent attraction. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, talent attraction. Uh, what, what strategies do you have to attract young talents and how do you keep them? What, what, is, your, uh, what is your concept? Um, I, I was looking at your homepage and I saw that you have, for, for instance, a graduate, certain graduate programs and, and other offers. Can you tell me have We have many offers for them. Um, the, the one topic is how do you get talent from the outside? The other topic is how do you find and promote talent from inside? For the outside, People, they have to see how are we changing in our ESG footprint. Yes, at the moment we had to um, again switch on our lignite plants, but it is because of the Ukraine crisis. Um, we are going to switch them off eight, eight years earlier. We're doing renewables only and the flexible technology. It is very important for the young people outside. And we are looking like crazy for everyone who can do wind, solar, and I see a few young people, wind, solar, US, Asia, mm -hmm. Australia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's where you have to be also sustainable. How are you treating the new joiners? How are you allowing them to move within a company? What are your benefits? Do they get a graduate program? We have graduate program for, for all whom who are applying and who are coming in. Um, how are you treating them during the graduate pro programs? Are they able to go all over the world? Do they have stations in US? Do they have stations in Asia? Um, what is their way through the company if they want to change from one company to another? How easy it is? Uh, what are our benefits? Do they have, very important, do they have a chance to get sabbaticals for PhD or whatever? Do we have talent programs? So how do we pick those? Two of most important we are doing in e with the ENS at ESMT. It's so-called C-level potential candidates. Mm -hmm. Those who are the next one coming into the C-level. And director level potential, which we are starting just now. So those for N minus one, where we, for example, completely changed nomination from the managers. We changed completely into the self-nomination so that no hidden talent is being overseen or hide it by the manager so that they also get a chance. And all a salary is normal. And um, th that, that's how we do it. We have to stay consequent on that. And uh, we have to go with the time to look permanently. F just to give you an example, company car 10 years ago uh, was the call of the day. Today, you are more or less talking about mobility and allow them to pick, are they doing e-bike, are they buying a car, or how are they treating that? Mm -hmm. or what is a type of hybrid working? Do you have two, three-day policy, mm -hmm. etc.? We have mm -hmm. no days which are fixed. It is being done within a teams together with a manager. When are they in the office? When are they at home? It's up to them, to the teams it's up to, to decide team, how... To the, together with the manager, up to every team mm -hmm. to decide how many days are they in the office, how many days are in home. It's all bunch of topics around it. It's no mm. silver bullet. Mm. 
Well, now that we're living in these um, time of multiple crises and transformation, what would you think that do young people, young talents need different skills, different qualifications than some years before? Do you have to be, I don't know, more resistant, more global thinking, or I don't know, is it is it different in your eyes? It depends on the company to which you go. It depends on the business. Mm. I mean, they they are simply through the digitalization more open, more international than my generation was. But I do not necessarily see that they have to be completely different. They are different per se, mm. through the evaluation of the world. But um, their, their personal skills, their passion, that's not really different than ours was. Mm. They just work differently given the world they are in. Mm. Talking about the crisis there, I just read a study saying that um, it's amazing that one third of the employees in Germany are overloaded, stressed, and do have psychological problems uh, because of the permanent crisis they experience. Uh, is this, uh, does this match with your experience and how would you deal with this? How do you catch those employees who are really struggling? Corona has changed a lot. It has changed on one side the stress level, but at the same time has given certain freedom by being at home, working from home, etc. And the turn back from Corona is another stress. So there are two stresses in very, very short time. Mm -hmm. um, We try to see it staying close to the people, but I have to be honest, we are not like Daimler or like DPDHL, who have 150 or 450,000 people. We have only 18,000. If you look at our balance sheet, you might not believe it, but we are only 18,000, one eight, not eight zero, in 39 countries. So we have a chance as a managers to stay very close to our people, and that's what we do. And we try... I read it somewhere last week, I don't know whether you see in it, business instead busyness. Again? Business yes. instead of busyness. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. um, we try to ask ourselves what is really needed and what not, mm -hmm. instead of just producing something what no one needs. And I believe that's needed in every company. There are many things um, which are being done because they're being done, but not because someone uses it. In my young times, I used to do reports for someone, and when I was not sure that someone is reading it, I used to send three times the same, and if no one complained, I didn't do it anymore. <laughs> um, it's, uh, if you look in a certain type of companies, That's probably similar with today. So we should clean up the barn and do only important things. Mm -hmm. And that's something every manager should ask her or himself. Are we really doing the real important things? <laughs> Now, Mrs. Segan, something different. Um, I prepared a little questionnaire. I'm sure you have done this before. <laughs> I prepared some sentences and I would like you to finish them Okay. Spontaneously, if you, if you don't mind. Okay? I'll try to. Okay. So, when I get up in the morning, first thing I do is... Brush my teeth. <laughs> Feet or teeth? Teeth. Teeth. Okay. <laughs> if I could improve one of my skills in my job, it would be... A few more languages. Mm -hmm. My greatest success in my profession has been that I'm still in a very good relation to all the companies I worked for and people there. Yeah, that's not the normal thing, right? Uh, if, you, if I could work one day in another profession, I would... I would really like to be Nikola Tesla. You might don't believe it, but that was my dream. Really? Yeah. <gasps> He's why, coming why from the same country. Yeah. 
He was the founder of Wechselstrom. Yeah. So Tesla is not a, cl- a car name. And his name was Nikola Tesla, and he came from former Yugoslavia. I would love to be him because he didn't didn't write everything down. So people are still thinking about what were the things he was working on. One of the things he worked on is that we have electricity today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so maybe you can keep this in mind and do this, you know, mm-hmm. later. He was too smart for me. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, if you use the internet, you have to log on with new complicated passwords all the time. I find this... The right thing to do because of the security. That was the, the correct answer? <laughs> That was the cybersecurity <laughs> responsible Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> of course, of course. But I'm sure you hate it as well as, as, all we, do, as we do. So, um, if you would... If you could choose a famous person to have a beer with at a hotel bar, this person would be? George Clooney. Ooh, <laughs> interesting. Did you have well, a I'm just a human being, come yeah, on. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe you, okay, then my next, next question must be, if you could choose, would it be champagne or would it be Nespresso? I don't drink alcohol, so it would be Nespresso. Oh, okay. I'm sure he likes this. And you talk about what with him? About the human rights. The human rights? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, my last question. If I would be Chancellor of Germany, first thing I would do, I would change is... Oh, God, there is not only one thing. I, I cannot say that. No. No. No answer. Too political. Okay. Too political. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to you. That was, uh, that was interesting and gave a, little, a brief personal insight, I think. So um, what I must admit is that part of these questions have been, uh, have been done by chat GPT. And I was surprised. I was not impressed. I didn't think it was really creative. But this brings me to my next topic, which is AI. Um, I've said that I would like to ask you questions about your IT knowledge and expertise. Um, You have held high-level executive positions, being responsible for IT, huge companies. So what role do you think chat, GPT and AI will play in the future? Important role. They're going to be a waterfall moment for many jobs, they're going to define the new jobs, they're probably going to replace certain things. But what I hope is that we will keep in mind it's only prediction, it's not knowing, it's simply prediction. We still have to use our mind. Yeah, but the question is how Will you be able in the future to figure out if a text or a picture or a video is done by, you know, the, the technique or by a human? Will we be able to really no. di- differentiate? No, we are not going to be differentiating. Being able to differentiate, that's my view. But I still believe in the knowledge and understanding and questioning of a human being who has to go through it and not just take it for given the way AI gives the information to us. The, the, our federal consumer protection minister, uh, Steffi Lemke, just demanded that uh, AI articles or pictures should be labeled in the future, should have a label saying this is done by chat GPT or done by AI. You think this could be the right way? It could be one of the points. Look, that's, that's at the point where we... We, we should talk about it, how to deal with that. Labeling it could be probably, probably something. Um, I'm, I'm rather coming from the other side. I don't believe we should, we're in, in the industry, rather discussing do we, should we allow our employees to use it. I'm the one who always say use it because we cannot push them into the uh, last century and say no, we are not using that. But uh, if we use it together with the our own mind, we are going to be, again, quicker and better 
because our understanding and our way of thinking is different, so we're going to it's going to help us, but it's not going to replace us. Mm. So you see a lot of opportunities. Um, at the same time, you have set up uh, regulations at uh, RVE, I think, how to use AI in your company, and you're doing um, trainings with your employees. Yes, because people do not really understand everything, and it's our job to explain them how to work with that. Mm -hmm. uh, they do not understand if they put corporate data in there, it's like posting it off on Instagram, mm -hmm. because it becomes part of public knowledge. If they put names in there, that, that can be followed up who and where. Um, so we leave it to them, we we'll allow them to use it, but we educate them that they have to read it that they have to read the outcome, they have to understand what it is, they have to compare it with their knowledge instead of just leaving them alone with it. I believe it's our obligation. And it's a strong uh, responsibility for a leader, isn't it? Sh sure. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are several companies who just closed the um, entry to chat GPT on, in, in the company, but I mean, That just makes no sense because mm -hmm. Google now also implemented an AI engine mm -hmm. behind Bing of Microsoft is also ChatGPT. So you cannot put them offline. Mm -hmm. You have to educate them and that's, that's the path we are going. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a, a huge discussion going on about uh, ChatGPT and AI. Uh, and one of the major questions really is, will we be able to control AI in the future, in the long term? And there are serious experts uh, warning. Even the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, is demanding that AI should be controlled similar to nuclear weapons. Do you see this danger, this risk? I probably do not look far enough into the future. Um, at the moment, I would not still still not see it. I, I've discussed with a friend some weeks ago about one other situation, which is for me at the moment, because it's close, near a future, uh, also dangerous. There is an information out there that by 2026, AI is also already going to um, copy all the content of the internet. So, uh, ChatGPT is going to have all the content of the internet and the question, is there anything new coming out of that? And what impact is it going to have on the population is something that I'm thinking of at the moment because that's also dangerous if you, if you do not develop anymore but just get another evaluation of what is already existing, it's not bringing the population forward. Um, is it going to come to the point of nuclear weapon? I cannot tell that. I mean, I have to think it over. I didn't mm -hmm. think about it. Mm. Um, I would like to put you w one last question in this context, oh. and then I would like to give you the opportunity to put questions as well. So think about it and just raise your hand, please. And also the on audience uh, online is invited to put questions. Uh, talking about uh, data, which is of course the resource of the future, um, we must talk about um, data security. Cyber security and cyber attacks are one of the major threats companies are facing now. I mean, especially uh, energy companies uh, who belong to the, to the critical infrastructure in Germany. So is there actually a way at all to protect a company from cyber attacks? I mean, can one say this clearly? There is no 100%. The 100% do not exist. Y you can do what you know. Uh, you can implement what you know. You have, you have to be cautious. You have to train your people every day, etc. Uh, but if you, if you experience so-called zero attack, Something that appears what, what, what this? A something that appear, appears very first time. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that protects you. So uh, it's not that companies are not cautious, and it's still, uh, and that's why it happens. It still happens also other way. I'm 
far beyond the point where I believe there is a hundred percent and I don't believe it, it'll ever exist. Hackers out there are developing also every day. They are using the newest technology, so we are we are all kind of a step behind it, using and protecting ourselves from what we know. What we don't know, AI, mm. is probably a solution. Because I, I told you already in our video conference, I strongly believe in the Israeli way of cyber protection. They do everything with AI. They screen their systems, constantly finding out what came up last, even last night, to predict where might the next attack come from. That's probably the closest way to 100%, but 100% do not exist. Mm. Okay, well, <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's, that's an answer how it is. we have to live with, yeah. So, do you have uh, any questions you would like to put towards Mrs. Sega? Just raise your hand. Um, I do have two questions from the online audience. One question is about what you've said earlier about... Um, about reaching out to your employees uh, in the evening, during vacation, and things like this, and you said, unless it's really burning, you wouldn't yeah. call them. So the question by Giorgio Quartini is, how does your statement fit to keeping the respect for people on holidays? Well, this is what you said. What does burning mean to you? Um, different managers may apply a very different scale of urgency, which could make this event rather more likely than only exceptional. The last sentence is one I didn't get. Different managers may apply a very different scale of urgency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's absolutely right. Mm. I, I can give you ex an example. My uh, CISO of cybersecurity head is at the moment on holidays as long as we don't have any cyber attack. But if you would have heavy cyber attack, DDoS and something like that, his team can solve. If you would have, his, have heavy cyber attack, I would call him. Mm -hmm. This is one example. This that's that's one mean, example of urgency, yeah. Yeah. because I know he is the one and only yeah. if, there is, if, if, if it's really a dangerous situation. Otherwise, even with a small DDoS or stuff like that, mm. I would not pick up the phone. Mm. His team can solve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, another question is by Koko Barkomi. Um, have you ever faced sexism in the workplace? If so, how did you deal with it? I have to be honest, I never did. Never. In 38 years of work, I never did. And I'm very careful to give any advice and say anything for whatever I always had a great male colleagues and it was always just a really respectful and great working with each other. Mm -hmm. And everything else I would say would not, would not, would not fit. It's, I had 38 years of great colleagues in my work and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I know there are different situations mm -hmm. out there. Are there any more questions? Just take the chance. There is one question over there. Wait, wait for the microphone, please. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm nice to meet you. I'm Yan Yan, and I'm a full-time MB student in, at EJSMT, and also I'm a co-president of the Women in Leadership Club here. And uh, thanks for your sharing. It's very insightful. And uh, my question is that, um, can you share some experience of the your like mentorship, like being a mentor or being a mentee, like uh, how do you find it help in your life and in your work? And also, do you have any suggestion for like young people to have mentorship? Thank you. Yes, I believe you need mentor in in any way as as soon as possible. Uh, probably not not during your university. Just sit, sit sit down. You don't need to stand there. <laughs> um, and I do believe it has to happen fr frequently. And you have to be open also to those outside of the company. Being mentored just inside the company gives you the pro the, the the company view. But 
I tend, when I mentor people, to give them also for special areas of development. My colleagues from the other companies, as an add-on mentors, so that they also get an outside in view. And what I see, if you do it like that, they develop by far quicker than if you just mentor them within the company. It's, it's funny, yes, it's danger that one of them says, oh, wow, what a great person. <laughs> What's more important, Nana's friendship, or did I take this manager? No, it's, it's really, that's the best way you can do. You mentor people and give them mentors from an outside also. And from my own perspective, I told you, I had a great bosses uh, along my career. As I started, we didn't call it a mentorship. Um, that's how we call it today. But they always supported me and allowed me to make my mistakes. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Are there more questions here? Over there, please. Here comes the mic. Hi, Nana. Thank you for sharing. That was really insightful. Um, I have one follow-up question on your topics on AI and ChatGPT and how it affects leadership and also organizations. So one of the um, outrage about ChatGPT right now, it's, it makes us very easy to rely on it to craft sentences, to write, and also to think. Um, and it has been postulated that the more we use that, in the long run, we'll have a um, reductions in the way we can articulate and also really think about an issue. What do you think um, on the side effect of using such an advanced tool on things that we do on a daily basis, especially in the work context? And do you think that will affect the emergence of future leaders who does not really understand concepts and does not think critically? Thank you. I understand what you mean. Do I believe in that? No, I don't. And probably just to give you a reason why. As I have studied, we had to calculate by heart, you know, ourselves. How do you do it today? Calculator, exactly. And you still know how it works? Well, <laughs> otherwise you could not just tell the calculator what to do. You have to use the, the right things. There are, there are things which are important to know and we know them and there are things which become normal, standard and, and we let the machine do them. So uh, we probably forget certain, certain things which are simply normal level and we start enhancing ourselves into the higher level so we have space for that. That's why I do not believe that we are for going to forget our voice. We are going to learn something new. And that's why I'm not afraid of that. I'm just afraid of one other topic, that we are losing all the generation. That's my biggest worry. Because as more effective are we with all these new technologies, as, and given our demographic curve, we are losing the older generation. And that's where we have to find an answer, because as older the society becomes, as more of them we are losing. And that's our obligation to keep still contact with them. Mm -hmm. There is another question uh, online. Katrin is asking, uh, thank you for your insights. From your perspective, what are the three most important characteristics for the next generation of leaders? Three important characteristics. Here they are. Must it be three? <laughs> Whatever you want. Passion. Passion. Passion for what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Because without passion, there is no real success. Just doing to do something has never been great. It's been good. Mm -hmm. But to be great, you need passion for what you're doing. So is passion something uh, those people have who are asking for a purpose, who want a purpose in yeah. work? Yeah? yeah, this goes along? Yeah. You think? Mm -hmm. Okay. I also believe that a company needs a purpose. Yeah. A question over here. Can you please pass the mic quickly? Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your insights. Uh, my name is Rigus Platt. I work for the Hasse Plattner Foundation, and I think that's a good signal word to just mention as the purpose. You talked about challenges with the current generation in attracting talent. Um, you lightly touched on, on the purpose thing while addressing younger audiences here, like we do green stuff and we look for wind, but what are your, what are your like strategies in actually addressing purpose in the, uh, in the company to attract people? Because most of the young people, as we see also in our foundation, are actually working because of a strong purpose of their work. So how do you give, as within a classic uh, industry company, how do you give the jobs that you actually uh, have a purpose so the current generation, the current younger generation actually um, finds them attractive? Our, our current strategy named under Growing Green is exactly showing our core business. And if you, if you look at our growth, you'll see exactly where it's happening. So what, what we promote toward young people is what they find when they come in. And that's, that's exactly our way forward. We are very clear on how going away from CO2, from lignite, we have switched off our last nuclear plant of 15th of April. So it's lignite still there, but it's clear going way down. We do, not, we do believe that it's good to do it within a company because that's our heritage. That's where we come from. And just putting in, in some other foundation, it's the easiest way to say we're green, but it's not necessarily the best. We have an obligation. But if you, if you look how are we growing and where are we growing, there are exactly those renewables markets. So that's our purpose, to produce green energy. We jumped into the hydrogen very early. Although we know until 2030 there is not a single euro to, to, to earn there, but we have to be, believe that in certain areas you have to be first mover, and that's where they see exactly this growing green when they come in. Answers your question? <laughs> Some more questions here in the audience. Over there, please. Hello, my name is Suvida. Um, I believe that uh, the great achievers in the world across uh, have some core habits that allow them or help them achieve uh, whatever they achieve. So I would like to know what are your core habits uh, that have allowed you to be who you are today? Well, I have now to think about which, uh, whom are you talking about? Well, they're, they're this genius, you know, like Steve Jobs. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> okay, just to be clear. There are those like Elon Musk. He is a genius, a little bit crazy, but genius. I'm not. Um, if you talk about managers, um, I believe you stay on it. Simply do not give up. Just continue growing, continue learning, continue working, if you, if you get those th three things together and just keep on moving, you'll arrive at the right place. It is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm for definitely not one of those who have an artificial behaviors. I just stayed on my path along all these years and learned whatever I could in any job. I learned in any company, I learned, I learned even today, even when I get out of here, I've learned something new. So that's something that brought me where I am. Are there more questions? Uh, yeah, one is here and then we have another one over there. And then I think time is running out almost. Mm -hmm. Uta Menges, diversity consultant. Wonderful to have you here today. What is uh, the one diversity measure or activity you appreciate the most by its success or by your personal perspective on it? Well, I want them all. I, I, I never have only one. <laughs> Because if you stay on it only one, uh, especially in Germany, you, you stick to gender diversity, you know? And I believe that's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's simply not enough. 
So uh, I try to promote our LGBTIQ network because I believe it's important. Um, I try to have different nationalities, forcing people to stop speaking Rheinisch, not even German. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's our past. Um, that's what we do, having new colleagues from, from India, from UK, with our, in our German team also, uh, also taking care about gender diversity, people of color, everything. I believe we should not focus on only one, because if we focus on only one, there is a danger that we forget the rest. So, uh, if you ask me anything that's related to that, it inspires me, and it will keep inspiring me for the future. I try to inspire others. Uh, there is a question in the second row over there. Yeah, thank you. Volker Zilt, um, once upon a time, mainly in the last millennium, I used to work in industry as well. And in order not to lose the older generation, I thought I should ask a question. Um, both of you use the term manager and leader. Maybe by chance, maybe not. So my question is, do you see a difference between a manager and a leader? Or let me put it up in another, in another way. Does every manager have to be a good leader? And every leader has to be a good manager? And in relation to that, do you use a dual letter career system at RWE? Do we use? A dual letter career system. I have to... Just, what do we, what just do one, one sentence I, what, to explain what, what you're talking about. What is this? Yeah, what do you do with the top tech people of whom you are pretty sure they would not be good leaders? Oh. But they are absolutely essential for the company. Okay, l l let, me, let me try it. First, I never heard the word inspiring manager, but I've heard the word inspiring leader. So it probably answers your question. Yes, there are managers who are not inspiring leaders on certain positions, but I prefer inspiring leader because uh, it is, for me, more than a manager. And um, there are people in essential positions who are not good managers, but do they need to be managers if they are in a key position, or do they be key function holder? Is it about manager, or is it at the end about what are you paying for them? If they are not the good managers, I would not let them manage people. Because it is, uh, it is a big danger that, that they don't do, good, do it right, but you have to still treat the person with a respect for your company. And it is always the question how you respectfully give to the people the right information why he or her is needed for the company, but is not managing a team. Well, the, the big problem is that, you, that, that people many times do not learn how to respectfully have such a conversations. And that's a big problem. And that's why I believe that managers and leaders have to learn how especially such types of discussion with people uh, can be led respectfully. Even if you want to separate from someone, you can do it respectfully. And that's important. And that's why, coming back to my start, there is no word inspiring manager, but there is a word inspiring leader, and that's what I expect. Does it answer your question? Well, the second part of, of the question was about those people who are not really fulfilling the, you know, the... Um, how did you explain this? The top tech people, those who are in you know. Yeah, but it's it would. Yeah, but it's funny, being more than 30 years within IT industry, uh, my personal experience makes sure they have exciting projects and exciting topics, 
and make sure you understand how much market is paying. Excuse me to say that. Um, you do not necessarily need uh, to give them a team to lead. If they are experts, you must have expert positions and take care that they are on interesting topics. That's how you keep IT people. I mean, that's, that's something what many companies forget. You can get the best guys out there. If you do not have interesting projects, they are away within a year. So that's, that's what I take care of, how I would take care of tech people. So, in regard to the time, I would like to put one last uh, qu question <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the request for a short answer. Um, you know, having you here today was so, I think, really inspiring, as you named it, uh, and we, we got uh, really rare insights, as I promised. So, what advice would you give those female um, um, aspiring female uh, p persons here in the audience who are aiming to become CEOs or to hold high-level executive positions. What are your recommendations? Oh, I'm not here to recommend how to become a CEO. I'm not a CEO, so I cannot talk about it. Um, just what I said before, just keep on going and never give up and learn every day. Okay, <laughs> we take this as a very good last sentence. So thank you so much for being with us today. Nana Zega, it was wonderful having you here. Thank you very much for thank your openness. You. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so, and I'm, I'm sure you, you're able to put some more questions because uh, maybe Nana Zega will stay a bit longer here for the reception we're going to have. Uh, now, because we're almost at the end, and I'm looking forward to have uh, some drinks and some talks with you. But uh, I want to say goodbye, but um, I would like to um, introduce to you um, two ladies who are uh, involved with the IZF, the EZF, which is the Institut für uh, Zukunftsfähige Führung, and we are really thankful that they are supporting so nicely this uh, event series. And I would like to ask Uta Menges and Claudia Horner to come on stage for the last remarks, and they also have a very valuable hint for you. Thank you for your attention. I'm saying goodbye for now. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Uta Menges, my colleague Claudia Horner. We both are representatives of EZF, Initiative Zukunftsfähige Führung. And that's what we talk about in, in this series, about leadership and especially with a look into the future in a future leadership. But first of all, I want to thank ESMT and especially Molly Ilbrock for this very fruitful partnership. We uh, appreciate every event. It was the third one to, uh, today and we look forward to some more. And you are managing the organization of the whole framework here of this uh, series uh, very professionally. Thanks uh, to you and to the organization ESMT for this partnership. Also, thank you to Astrid, who is with us for the third time and uh, having always wonderful questions <laughs> to our guests uh, with, uh, and provide us a lot of insights. And uh, I would also thank our special guests today, Tatjana Luand and Nana Sega. Uh, it was great. It was great, especially for me as I'm working in the diversity area. <laughs> it was uh, very interesting to hear your insights. And uh, uh, it, uh, yeah, it was it was really uh, very uh, uh, yeah valuable for me. And um, yeah, but you want to hear what is EZF about? Uh, that's why we are standing here. <laughs> so it's an initiative, an, an organization, an association uh, located in in Stuttgart with some um, chapters in in different uh, cities. And we work uh, together um, on a voluntary basis. It's an association. 
and we do this besides our regular jobs, we work on uh, leadership. And uh, the core of EZF is the dialogue about leadership. So we have a lot of interesting formats um, to, um, to, to foster the dialogue about uh, leadership, about the um, expectations for future leaders, what do they need, how we can develop them. And we use this association and the network with wonderful people from different industries, from universities, from politics, um, to exchange and to learn, as you said in your last sentences, to learn all the day how we can develop further and what we can provide to our members and to interested guests to uh, learn more about future leadership. And I will hand over to Claudia. Thanks, thanks Uta. Thanks, Uta, and thanks a lot for your talk and for your interview. Uh, I am the rep representative for the region of Berlin and berlin Brandenburg, and the idea is to get into a dialogue for future leaders or future leadership or leadership for the future or whatever. I don't know exactly. <laughs> and the idea is to be in a dialogue. We offer a couple of different formats and settings. And I just will invite you to join one of our next uh, formats, which will be on the 12th of June. We have invited um, a lady from the car selling company in the second generation. I think this also could be interesting for a couple of uh, in insights. And there is some more information we are going to meet on Friday, 2nd of June. We are going to meet on a virtual basis outside. You will find, find the URL, I think. And we are going to have the discussion and we are going to talk about the important sentences. And I'm so sorry that I didn't write them down, but I will have to do this tonight. A couple of things, for instance, business in busy in instead of business, nee. <laughs> the other way around, but you know what I meant. Uh, so thanks a lot, and I will be happy to see one of you over there Friday. I will be the facilitator for this hour when we meet virtually. Thank you. Yeah, and now, of course, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would like, or I would like uh, to invite you on behalf of uh, ESMT to have some drinks over there and we can have some chats and uh, discuss all what we have heard today. Thank you very much for being with us and thank you for your attention. Thank you.